All right, here we go. We have former NBA champion William Bedford in the building. Welcome to Vlad TV. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, you have a, a very, very interesting story. You know, we've interviewed a lot of NBA guys over the years, but I think your story is very different than most people that I've interviewed. So I want to start in the very beginning. So you grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Yes. So what was Memphis like in the 70s and 80s? It was more, it wasn't a lot of violence like it is today. Um, back then it was more people looked out for each other. People looked out for your kids and, you know, it, it was a more family oriented type of place back then. Everybody was pretty much together. Okay. And you grew up with both parents, single parent? Yes, I grew up with both parents. Three sisters. Okay. Three sisters. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, growing up, you said it was a lot you know, safer than it is these days. I mean, but did you get mixed up in the streets at all or were you generally a good kid? Well, no, as, a, as, as my days grew up, um, I'd say junior high to high school. No, I didn't get into a lot of trouble because I always had coaches that would come over them on the weekends and pick us up about six in the morning on a Saturday and take us to the gym and pretty much just, you know, showed us a lot of skills, a lot of old school coaches there, a lot of guys that played before us was there. So they uh, pretty, pretty much took up a lot of time with us so sort to of teach us the game. Okay, so you went to Melrose High School in Memphis. Yes. And I guess by the time you were, in, as a freshman, you were six foot nine. Yes, I was six nine. Uh, by the time I left Mexico High School on an all senior high team, um, that coach, which was Coach Briggs at the time, took up on time to teach me how to play basketball because I was 6'9 at the time and I couldn't even make a layup. I really didn't even like basketball at first beginning. So, And then upon him and another, a lot of other guys coming and grabbing me and taking me places to play, I ended up learning how to play the game. And then I left there and went to Merrill's High School my 10th grade year. Right. I think in an in a, in a interview you said, honestly, I hated basketball. I was made to play basketball. I was six foot nine in the ninth grade and they made me play basketball because everyone kept telling my parents to make me play basketball. I hated basketball. When I was in ninth grade, I couldn't even make a layup. Exactly. Okay. So you literally hated the sport back then? Well, I hated it because everywhere I would go, I was going with parents or going with some place with relatives or my sister or somebody. Everybody was always asking me the same questions. Do you play basketball? Maybe you should. Your folks ought to make you play. And I'm like, who are you? You keep on telling me my folks need to make me play this, make me do that. And I, I got to the point where I hated basketball so much because everywhere, I don't care if it went to the grocery store, people were stopping my parents. Does he play? Y'all ought to make him play. And I hated that. Hmm. Okay. So then in 83, you went to Memphis State University, which is now University of Memphis. Mm -hmm. And you said once you got there, that's when you actually started learning plays and so forth. Well, see, growing up, I would always run so much, you know, and, and the coaches told me always, you know, if I don't learn the plays, the least you can do is change ends of the floor. And by that way, you change ends of the floor, 90% of the time, you might touch the ball. So I used to run all the time to get all the rebound block shots I could because if I know if I run everybody, I get a dunk on the other end. So I, I tried my best to outrun everybody all the time. Okay. And by the time you got to college, were you already, because you were seven foot one? Seven one. So were you already seven one by the time you got to college? Mm -hmm. I was seven one when I got to college. Okay. So you were just one of the big, one of the big guys on campus at that point, literally. Yes. Along with Keith Lee. Right. Exactly. So you guys are playing for Memphis State. And by 85, most of the team was like local Memphis guys. Everyone either came from Memphis or West Memphis on the team. Like 11 out of 12 players were actually hometown guys. That's right. That's right. And you guys had a big year that year. Mm -hmm. True. You guys almost uh, won the championship. Yes. Okay. okay. Final four. I'm going over. Okay. How did it feel to almost win? Almost exciting. <laughs> but, um, you know, back then it was, it, was, it was pretty big here in Memphis because all the guys that was on that team was from each rival high school here in town. And then we were all on the same team and had everybody in the Mid-South Coliseum together. 
And that's what really brought a lot of joy to the city because we were winning and then everybody was having a good time. And, you know, nobody's having a good time when you lose. So we were having great times when we was out winning and, you know, and um, we learned that half the city would, wouldn't go to work on days we had games. So, I mean, it was a pretty nice feeling though. Well, you had some very interesting teammates uh, on that particular team. Uh, one of which was Baskerville Holmes. Mm -hmm. um, he actually joined the NBA draft along with you and he got drafted by the Bucks, but he didn't end up actually playing with them. You know, he played some overseas. He came home, became a truck driver. And then by 1997, you know, I guess he had drug problems and depression. He ended up getting into an argument with his girlfriend and shot her in the head dead and then ended up killing himself right afterwards after telling one of his um, uh, relatives that the whole thing had been an accident. Um, did you keep in contact with, with Baskerville after oh, you guys after played? I, after I left Memphis, I didn't, uh, I didn't have any contacts with him because when he got drafted, I didn't know how to get in contact with him then. Then I didn't know he came back home and started driving trucks. When uh, I heard about the incident, it was kind of strange because I always knew how lively he was and how excited he always wanted to be. He always wanted to do stuff, get into things. And to be, you know, for him to get in depression, it's like, yeah, it's, it's hard to believe. But I guess it can happen to some people. You know, one of the other players on your team, Aaron Price, uh, he was killed in 1998 in a carjacking that was still unsolved uh, in Memphis. And then two years later, his brother got murdered as well. Mm -hmm. Did you keep in contact with Aaron? No, I never kept in contact with Aaron. Um, the only time we were close, so um, hung out was like when we was at school together, stayed in the dorm together. And uh, we would always yeah. have horse play on the road and everything. But no, after the season's over and the school was out, no, we never contacted each other. Right, and then your coach, uh, Dana Kirk, uh, after losing that season, uh, he, he ended up getting dismissed after one more season. Then he got locked up for tax evasion. Right, right, right. Yeah, I heard about all that after I was gone. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So then, you know, after that season, after playing uh, for college for three years, you ended up joining the NBA draft. Yes. Was there a reason why you joined, you know, after year three as opposed to just going one more year and graduating? Well, at that point in time, um, I felt like it was time for me to go. Um, um, I didn't feel like I had, you know, I wanted to stay in college another year because I was always thinking, I've always watched guys uh, stay in school another year and end up getting hurt. And then that final year, you know, they end up not getting drafted. They end up finding a job at home. So I decided to say, well, okay, well, let me go on to the NBA. Let me, you know, if this does happen to me, at least I'd already been a made some money for my family and for myself. And lo and behold, it did happen. It happened in a uh, preseason uh, against uh, Minnesota. No, it was against Denver Nuggets. And that was the first time I tore my ACL in. Well, you entered the, the NBA draft uh, in 86, was it? Mm-hmm. That year, uh, Brad Dougherty was the number one pick. Len Bias was the number two pick. John Sally was the number 11 pick. Dennis Rodman was the number 27 pick. And you were the number six pick. So before we get to you, did you know Len Bias at all? No, I didn't know him. I knew him by just watching him play on TV. And then when we were in New York, we took, you know, we took time to talk to each other, you know, and you know, joke around, play around. Because, you know, all those guys was hanging out our back together. And we all took pictures together. And um, we were always joking around about what kind of boats and yachts we were going to buy, you know. And uh, at that point, we never knew anything about him having any kind of problem because he looked like the average guy. I mean, just happy, full of life. And, you know, and from what I heard, that was his first time, which shouldn't have been his first time. It should have never happened. Right. I guess he got drafted to the Celtics mm -hmm. and he was celebrating with his friends. He yeah, took some cocaine. Back in school, yeah. Yeah, back in school, mm -hmm. overdosed and died. When you heard that news, what'd you think? At first, we couldn't believe it because, uh, like, me and Chris Washburn, we've been talking, we've been friends since 86. We talk all the time. And um, that was one of the things, I guess, that kept us 
communicating with each other because we were actually, the three of us took pictures together. We took pictures together a lot and we talked a lot amongst us three and then just to find out, man, he did. It's like, who, when, how? And it was unbelievable. So after we got the facts about it, I mean, it was pretty shaken, you know, for a while. It, it uh, That was one of the hurtful moments, I'd say, my first time in the NBA feeling hurt. That was the first one because I'm actually talking to the guy. Yeah. So by that point, you know, by the time you got to the draft, after going through college, had you touched drugs at all or were you completely clean? Well, in college, uh, I can say <laughs> that being in the Mid-South Coliseum, that big open space, I never played one game in the Mid-South Coliseum without marijuana, without being high. I never played one. There was no way I could run out on the floor with all those people watching me play. So I had to find a way to cope with it. And that was my way of coping with it, it was smoking weed before a game. And I did that through my entire college career because there was no way I could just walk out there or go out there to even stand. It's like even today, I can't talk to a large crowd of people, maybe about five to eight, 10 people maybe, but a huge crowd, it's, it's really hard. Okay, and was it anxiety, basically? I guess that you could call it anxiety back then, but you know, I didn't know that that's what you call it back then. I was just, I just had that fear of going out there and just everybody watching you. And it's just, it wasn't like high school days. High school days, you know, you're in a high school gym, it's a little box, but you're in this big, huge arena and you're in the wide open. Yeah, I mean, I did an interview with uh, former NBA player Richard Dumas. Uh, are you familiar with his story? Yes. I know Richard. Same Dumas kind of thing. Well. The anxiety of, of going into the game, he just couldn't deal with it. And he just had to get high off something. And then at one point, he got tricked into smoking crack, you know, while smoking some weed, I think. And then next thing you know, he's addicted to crack. And, you know, that kind of spiraled in its own way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you hear about this, you know, quite a bit. You said you did weed up to high school. What happened in high school? Well, I, actually, in high school, it's about, it was my sophomore year. I had, got started. We got to start playing basketball and everything. Well, there was a store by us. I found out I could buy a beer out the store and stuff because I'm like, okay. Well, ever since high school, that year, because I was like, I was just getting in the spotlight a little bit. And I don't really like the spotlight because I don't really like being around a lot of people and all that stuff. So I, I was like, man, we had a game. I was real nervous. So I drank, I drank about three beers one day right before the game. And I had a good game. And after that, I just started having a few beers before every game ever since I was 15. But then when I got to 18, I was still smoking weed and all that. A so-called friend of mine, he's the one that introduced me to the crack cocaine because it was supposed to have been a joint, just a regular joint, but I didn't know he had laced it because I was always afraid to even try the stuff because I saw all the pictures and everything. But, you know, I tried it because I didn't know what it was. And after that, I got addicted to that. I was like, oh, I'm off to the races on that. And that's how all of it got started. Okay, but regardless, were you, was it just weed all through college or did you dabble in anything else? Well, I, all through college, it was just weed. I didn't you know. I probably did cocaine once or twice, but I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. You know, and then um, uh, when I got to the NBA, I think it was in 1988 was when I tried it again. And after then, when I tried it, I, I didn't have a problem with it. I did do it about three or four times, but I didn't think I had a problem with it. But I knew I was yeah. smoking weed almost every day. And so then when they, when they, when they call me like two, three o'clock in the morning and telling me that they know I had a drug problem and I'm thinking to myself, how do you, who are you? How do you know I have a drug problem? All I'm doing is smoking weed. Well, to me, all I was doing is smoking weed and recreation and cocaine. I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't know I was doing that bad. And, um, yeah. um, um, after a while went by, they called and, and said, we can either we can play this game, you know, we can come and test you. And if you're dirty, we're going to suspend you for two years. Or you can admit yourself to a treatment center right now and you won't lose your pay and all that. And I'm thinking like, wait a minute. 
Okay, yeah, so if I wait till tomorrow and say I don't have it, then they're going to come test me, and they test me, and I'm dirty for this marijuana? That's why I say, okay, yeah, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm dirty. I'm, I need to go to treatment. Yeah, me. You know, because I knew they were going to test me for marijuana, and all that is going to be in my system. I'd been doing it every day. And so that's when I took that fall for that. It was like, okay, yeah, I got the problem, and you know, went off to Van Nuys, California. Okay, well, let's just... You know, we'll get to, to all that in a bit, but I just kind of want to go down the timeline. So you were picked number six mm -hmm. in the draft, uh, selected by the Phoenix Suns. Yes. Originally. Was it a big check when you first got drafted or not you so know, much? You know, I, I, back then, I didn't really care about seeing a check or knowing how much money I you know, made and all that because I just wanted to play basketball. I knew I was coming to the NBA and on, a, on a brand new team. And Phoenix wasn't a team that was up and running for a, a, a championship contenders at the time. But I felt like that I could be the one to go there and make a difference to help out the guys in order to make a team to go that far, just like I did in college, you know. And, and that's what I was trying to do when I went there. So, OK, so how was your rookie year with the Suns? It was pretty good. I mean, I can say myself it's besides getting hurt. But uh, my first year with the Suns are probably the best stats on my whole career that you could see. Okay. And then the next year, you got traded to the Detroit Pistons. Yes. Okay. And when you got there, John Sally was on the team. Yes. Uh, Dennis Rodman Dennis was Rodman. on the team. Mm-hmm. Uh, did the bad boy's name come when you had already gotten there, or did that come later? The bad boy name came the year, 1988, the year when I was uh, in treatment and they won against the Lakers. Got it. Okay. And then the next following year was when we did Portland. Got it. Okay. So here you are, you're playing for the Pistons. Uh, and that team is a powerhouse team mm -hmm. at that point. Um, but from what I understand, you know, at that point, you still were not really motivated and excited to play the game the way that a lot of the other players were. And that created a little bit of friction. I guess at one point, one of your, uh, one of your old college roommates came to visit you and Dennis Rodman kind of pulled him aside and, and said, Hey, you know, tell, tell William to grow up. So I don't remember that one. I've okay. heard that one before, but I don't remember that one. You okay. know, uh, for my old high school teammate to come from real from college. One of my teammates? Yeah. He came to visit you, and uh, allegedly the story came around. Uh, I don't, it could have happened. It could have happened. I don't remember uh, okay. at that time. By the time you got to the Pistons, was it still, I don't really like playing the game, and I'm just here for the check? Or at that point, were you really motivated to play? I was motivated to play because I felt like there was a team going for uh, a championship and they needed more players. So I thought I was going to come down to help. I didn't know I was going to come and sit behind four centers, or three centers at least. And I never got much game time after that. Okay. And what was Dennis Rodman like at that point? Because that was before the tattoos and the crazy hair and the, the dresses. And, he and was just a hard like player. He, all, he, all, he did the same thing he was doing now, you know. And he didn't start all that coloring the hair and all that until after he went to San Antonio. I mean, when he was in Detroit, Everything was the same, just to know him. He was just a, just that type of player still. Nothing changed about the way he played. Well, I mean, he's a future Hall of Famer. I mean, did you know how great he was at that point, or was he still developing? He was still developing at that point, but I knew he was going to go along. I know he was going to be in the league for a while. I mean, because, you know, there was not a lot of guys back then that was getting 20 boards a game. You know, people look at it and say 20 boards is kind of easy. In 48 minutes. No, it's not as easy as you think. It's hard to get five. Uh, yeah, especially playing against the best players in the world. Mm -hmm. And he was playing around the 50 greatest players already. Yep. Okay, so you finish off your first year, and then in 1988, that's when everything started to go wrong. And we talked about this, uh, you know, already. But so you were still smoking marijuana and a drug test basically came up positive? Yes, yes, yes. I was uh, I was still smoking. I had got comfortable, you know, because I wasn't playing. And then, uh, you know, I'm just sitting, I just lost interest. You know, I didn't I didn't feel like that, uh, 
I didn't even feel like a part of the team. And I just got complacent and just started using drugs again. I just started smoking weed, not knowing that, hey, any given time, somebody's going to come and test you. So I got a random test. That's what that was. And then I was ended up being dirty, so I had to go back to treatment again. Okay, so they basically gave you the option to potentially lose two years in the NBA or just go to rehab. Right. Okay, so, and this is the first time you're going to rehab? Mm -hmm. First time. So what was that, what was that like? Well, I mean, it was just a learning experience, you know, it just went, it was like another hospital, you know, like you were going in a hospital for something. It was set up just like one. So, I mean, it was strange at first, but I just looked at it like, uh, like a class, you know, it was just, that's all we did. Went to many classes and meetings. So, um, it helped a lot. Okay, and the year you went, that was 88, mm -hmm. right? 88. Uh, and that same year, Detroit went to the finals? Yes. Was that uh, when they lost to the Lakers? That's when they beat the Lakers. When they beat the Lakers. Okay, got it. So the year before, you were on the team. You guys get to the finals. You lose to the Lakers. Yeah. That next year... You guys make it to the finals and you beat the Lakers, but you're off the team because you're in rehab. Right. So are you in rehab when the finals are happening? Yes. So you're sitting there in rehab watching your team win the finals and celebrate with us. Watching you. every moment. <laughs> how how heart wrenching was that? It was it was hurtful at the time, but you know, with the people I was around back then, it it made it a little easier because it was like you at the point to where you know, you got a chance to do this again. And uh, you may not have been there to do this one. So just be blessed that you can sit here and watch that and know that this is the place you want to be next. Okay. So after rehab, you actually rejoin the team again. Yes. And by this time, they're actually the bad boys. Mm -hmm. What changed with the team after you came back? I don't think much changed. I think... Um I think I just, I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. They still welcome me back with open arms, you know, like um, me and Isaiah has been friends since I was in the eighth grade. And they just still, they welcome me back with open arms and like, you know, let's play. Just, you know, all that's behind you and let's just move forward. And that's what we did. Well, I mean, the bad boys got their name because a lot of people felt that they played dirty. Okay. Would you agree or disagree? I disagree. Okay. Why it wasn't that? dirty. It was physical. There's a difference between between playing dirty and playing physical. You know, physical, you got to show what you did in the weight room. You know, if you get the ball down low, you got to make sure that you know what you're doing with it. That's physical. Okay. Now, you know, you want to try to hurt somebody, then, you know, you taking necessary swings and elbows and the stuff that really cause a fight. But we just played physical. You know, we just touch you with our body or we fouled you hard. You get in the paint, there's no layup. Well, I mean, to be fair, Bill Ambeer was on your team who was considered the dirtiest player ever <laughs> by some people. Okay. <laughs> do, do you think that's a fair a fair uh, label or do you think that's unfair? Now, if he's on your team, you love him to death because he <laughs> makes the game so much easier by getting those people out of their game. He do everything, foul, smack them on the arm, anything, just anything to get on their nerves because they didn't like him anyway. But that was the cause of us winning a lot of games because him and Rick would get people just completely – Forget about basketball. Let's just fight. And you can't do that. But as they're getting mad, we just playing. Because we did the same thing to each other in practice. Okay. So the 1990 season starts. And uh, you actually set an NBA record uh, that year. You, uh, as a member of the Pistons against the Seattle Supersonics, you set an NBA record for the fewest minutes played in a game with three or more three-pointers made. You shot three for three in a minute. Yeah. So you made three three-pointers three, three, three in one minute. Well, I remember that game very well. We were, uh, <laughs> we were there, and everybody already knows that Sean Kemp and I had the same agent. And, you know, Sean Kemp, you know, he was destroying everybody doing all his dunks and the whole nine yards. So... 
Our first five, I guess first eight man rotation wasn't cutting the mustard. You know, they were just didn't shoot good, wasn't playing good the whole game. So right almost about, I say about two minutes left in the game, maybe less, Chuck Data told all of them to sit down and empty the bench. As I'm running past them, I say, Chuck, we got the green light. Chuck said, I don't care what y'all do. Okay. So when he went to sit down, I talked, I told Lance Blanks. I said, Lance, run my plate three times in a row. He said, you for sure? I said, man, run the play three times in a row. Okay, we down 12. We down 12. He come down, I set the first pick, he tossed it back, tell me I shoot it, go in. Okay, go back down, it's a turnover. Come back down again, they passed me the ball, we called 15, he went off the other side, the opposite way, passed it back to me. I shot and hit another three. So, by this time, we go to the other end, we foul us a one and one. He missed the one and one. We go back to the other end. That's what Michael Cage was playing. We go back to the other end. We run the same play. He give it to me again. I pump fake Michael Cage and step one side and shot it again. I hit three threes on a row. They call timeout. Chuck put the whole first five back in. We end up losing the game. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Well, And then by the end of the season, you guys make it to the finals against the Portland Trailblazers, and you guys beat them 4-1. Uh, what was your role in those finals? Really just to, 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 to be there in case they need me. Um, stay in shape. Uh, stay positive. Uh, pretty much just be ready to go at any time because somebody could go down and you need to step in that place and be able to pick it up. And that's what I did. I did that the whole time. The whole playoffs. I was always ready to go. How did it win to actually win a finals on a team you're on at this point? You know, it, it felt like my high school days because we won a championship in high school. We were the underdogs in high school. We were an all-black team coming from Memphis, playing against an all-white team from Memphis, which was Briarcrest. We ended up beating them in the state tournament, and they gave the, on the losing team the MVP. <laughs> so Wow. And yeah, and, and it felt something like that but I, you know, without the MVP part. Got it. But at this point now, you're an NBA champion. Yes. So I'm sure that felt great. It did. It felt good for a while. I mean, uh, uh, I knew that we were always the number one team to beat. So I was always talking noise the rest of the summer. Well, then the next year, you're still on the team. Mm-hmm. You guys make it to the Eastern Conference Finals mm -hmm. and you guys get shut down by the Bulls. Right. Michael, Michael Jordan. Right. What was it like to play against Jordan during that time? Um, Jordan was Jordan. I mean, you know, he, just like you see him on TV, it's like that in person. I mean, like they say, the tape don't lie. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he wasn't the type of guy that go by and talk noise until you started talking to him. Now, if you start talking to him, then we got problems. He's just going to go off. Hmm. Okay. Did you two ever get into it on, on the court? No. No. It wasn't that type of game with us. Okay. Well, after the Bulls won, uh, Jordan did an interview, and he talked about you guys. And he said, you see two different styles with us and them. The dirty play, the flagrant fouls, the unsportsmanlike conduct. Hopefully, that will be eliminated from the game. I think we can play clean basketball. We don't go out and try to hurt people and dirty up the game. You never lose respect for the champions. But I haven't agreed with the methods they used. I think people are happy the game will get back to a clean game with the Bulls' triumph away from this whole bad boy image. How do you feel about that statement? I mean, you've heard that before, I assume. Yeah, I heard it. Um, it didn't clean up. It didn't stop. Other teams picked it up. The New York Knicks picked it up right after us. So, True. no, the bad boy image didn't stop. It didn't get to go anywhere, you know. And he beefed up to get those next championships, too. They started playing the same way. Why? Because you got our players. You got John Sally. If I'm not mistaken, I think James Edwards on that by one time, and they had Dennis. So, how could you change from being a bad boy in them days and rugged playing to gaining it? And saying the NBA going to be clear. No, you inherited it. That's a good point. 
That's actually an excellent point. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the players ended up joining the Bulls. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and if it wasn't for Dennis Rodman coming from the Pistons, he wouldn't have got that six. I agree. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I mean, why do you think there was such a rivalry between Jordan and you guys? Because of the, the the players being from Chicago that was on our team. You know, we had Mark Aguirre and Isaiah both from uh, Chicago. And then you also, you got Michael Jordan as representing their home where they're from. And, you know, you got their whole families and everybody coming back there. So it, it was going to be a rival anyway because they're saying Jordan better than Magic and, and, and uh, Jordan and Isaiah into it now. And Isaiah beat them. But see, everybody forget. Isaiah beat all of them. Magic, Bird. And Jordan. All three. But they don't give him his props at all. This is true. At all. This is true. What was your relationship like with Isaiah? That's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. I have no complaints at all. I mean, he didn't you know I mean he he didn't treat me any special reason. I mean, I just you know, we from the first time I met him, I mean, he's been the same person ever since. Always told me to work hard and and be mannerable. You know, back then when I was young, I was be mannerable. Always say yes, sir, no, ma'am. You know, so it's always been that. Well, you guys win a championship, and then in '92, that next year, that's when you start being traded. So I guess in June you get acquired by the Clippers, and then you get acquired by the Bullets, <laughs> and then. Uh, the Bullets placed a contract uh, on waivers. Uh, then you became a free agent, and then you signed with the Spurs. Right. So you were kind of getting kind of tossed around from team to team, and see, right after, right, right, right after the, uh, right after the, 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 when we lost to the Bulls, and we had this little uh, event. At the palace, you know, all the guys got up and and congratulated each other and talked about how grateful they were for the crowd being there for them and their fans. They're grateful for the fans. And then they kept telling me, the two or three of them was talking about they passing the torch to me to come out. You know, I'm going to be the one that, that, that lead the Pistons now because I've been in the longest and they're going to move on because it's about time them to retire. And. I'm taking all that to heat like, yeah, I'm about to be him. You know, I'm, this is my chance. And I work out right after the season. I probably took a week off, maybe two, and started working out and pounding and going hard. Coming to find out they traded me to the Clippers. I'm like, well, what happened to me being the man again this year? So, I okay, Clippers. New, fresh team, up good team, young. Probably go there and make a statement. Plus, it's California. More, I get recognized more. So I didn't have any problems with going out there. And then when I got there, I think I played a little bit in the training camp with them. And uh, they called me one night at the hotel, told me they had to waive me because they couldn't pick up 20% more of my contract. So they sent me to the Bullets. I go to the Washington Bullets and I got West Sunset over there and we running and doing suicides and everything. We get ready to go play a preseason game. And the GM called me and told me he had to waive me because they couldn't do my contract. They couldn't pick up anymore. I said, okay. So I left there, went back home, went to Detroit. I wasn't planning on playing basketball anymore. I was going to retire. Then I get a phone call from uh, Jerry Tarkanian asking me to come down and back up David Robson. I'm like, really? I'm like, this is the chance I really need. This is what I want. So I get to San Antonio, go through preseason, go through the regular season, and we have our first East Coast swing for regular season. And guess who we're going to play against first? The Detroit Pistons. (laughs) Guess what? The night before the game, night before we get on the plane to go to Detroit, they waved me. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And that was essentially the end of your NBA career. Yes. That's when I I, I was just done after that. You know, after, after being traded to the Clippers, moving all the way out there. Then after getting traded to the Buddhists, moving on. Then they going down and they, they, they're releasing me again. Then I'm going to San Antonio and they're releasing me after that. I'm like, okay. I'm done with this rat race. I'm done with going to place to place to place. You know, it's, and I might as well just go overseas. Right. Um, you end up playing for the Oklahoma City Cavalry and the Grand Rapids Hoops. Right. 
Oh, uh, but essentially, played Oklahoma City Cavs for one season, and uh, left there and went to Grand Rapids. I didn't stay in Grand Rapids long at all. Yeah. I mean, how did it feel at that point to really leave the NBA? You know, and it didn't really seem like it was by your choice. It seemed like you were still ready to play more. Yeah, I was. I was ready to play a lot more because I played a lot in those teams. Um, I just took it as, you know, um, it was just time for me to go overseas. You know, I uh, I already spent six years in the NBA, and I was grateful for that because back in those times, you had to be, you, if you didn't last through the first year, then you wouldn't have going to make it in three and four years. So, I made it those times, and I was blessed to, to be able to play that long. So, I mean, I couldn't complain. Well, one of your interviews, you said, it's like you're trying to live that same lifestyle. Your check's not coming in anymore. In order to live that lifestyle as a professional athlete, entertainer, it takes a lot of money. So me, making the wrong decisions and choices, getting involved with some people that were involved with drugs, a bunch of other stuff started to happen. So after you leave the NBA, did you still have any drug issues at that point in terms of using? No, I didn't. Um, I didn't pick up drugs or start using drugs again to about maybe three years after that, because um, I'd moved to Texas. Uh, I'd moved in July, the month of July. I moved to Texas, and uh, we started going out. I started going out with people and hanging out at different places, and then people started smoking weed. And hey, I, I just fell right in the crowd. I was like, I'm not playing ball anymore. So. Why not? Then I got, you know, moving around with the wrong people. Okay, because you got arrested for drug possession twice in 96 and 97. Right. Was that just for marijuana? That was just marijuana. Okay. And when you say the type of people you were hanging out with were the wrong type of people, who were you hanging out with exactly? Well, at that time, uh, drug dealers. Guys that uh, I knew were drug dealers because I can tell, you know, I, to, I grew up around them all my life. I know what they look like. I knew they were. But at that time, I didn't care. I was finishing basketball. I didn't care who I hung around with. Well, a couple years later, you went from smoking marijuana to actually selling marijuana. So... What exactly was the transition point of you going from using the selling? Well, see, at first I was I was I was smoking a lot of marijuana and I was doing a little cocaine at the point in time. And then this guy told me, you know, when I was spending money, he said, "Man, it looked like you know the dumbest thing in the world for me to listen to was you should stop doing drugs and sell them because you know way more people now you can make more money." And I've got to think of like. Dumb as that thought is, it's like, yeah, I could stop and start selling drugs and make that. I said, yeah, then I can get back to having the money like I used to. Dumbest idea in the world. And I started doing it. I started selling drugs and um, started making a lot of money. Well, I mean, most drug dealers, you know, more or less try to stay under the radar. <laughs> You know, be inconspicuous. Here you are, a seven footer. I was <laughs> under the, the radar. Conspic- I still was under the radar. <laughs> You're still under the radar. It's a seven footer, the most conspicuous guy in the whole the whole city. Well, I essentially, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't look like your average drug dealer. I didn't run around with these cars and chains and jewelry. I didn't run around with all like that. I just, you know, when you see me, I probably was dressed in everyday wear or probably basketball gear. You know, I didn't. It was just the the, the people I was hanging around with. They were being watched way more than me. Right. So I wasn't expecting to doing all that. Well, during your NBA career, like, what was your biggest single year salary? Oh. Biggest single year salary? Yeah. It had to be my year with the Pistons, the second round in championship. Can you say how much that was? No. Okay. But it was in the millions, I assume. Too close. Okay. So here you are. You, you finish your NBA career making millions of dollars along the way. By the time you, you were done, did you have money put aside? Did you invest it? Or did you pretty much blow it all while you were playing? Well, you know, back in those days, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't getting money like they get now. You know, like um, back then, you know, we still, I don't know if they do it now, 
they still take out money for your rooms. They took, uh, uh, um, you got fines. Our fines was only a hundred dollars, but our, our money didn't come like they got now. Like the signing bonuses we got now, those guys throw that away daily. <laughs> you know, 2.4, my first one was 2.4 for four years. None of those guys have nothing even close to that. Right. You know, what's the minimum wage? Minimum wages when I was in the league was 75000 What is it now? About $2 million. Like eight, 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 hold on. Minimum NBA salary is... Uh, it's between nine, $925,000 and $2.6 million a year. It's <laughs> $2.6 <million. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and mine was... It, like Back in those days, it was $75,000. So... The contract look good, the paperwork and all that look good, but you don't get that. Right. I mean, there's taxes, there's managers. And you can pay taxes everywhere you play. You know, in some cities, yeah. you got to pay taxes there and you got to pay for your hotel rooms. And then you got to pay for everything that you, where you live, you know, all your 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 bills and, and a little bit liabilities. So. OK, so essentially, by the time you were out of the league, you didn't have a huge amount of money put aside. Right. So you started drug dealing. And did you start with marijuana or cocaine initially? I started with marijuana first. And I used to sell a lot of weed. And it was just, it just got to the point to where it was like it wasn't doing enough for me. So then I ventured, and ventured off into selling cocaine. Okay. And I mean, the cocaine game is a whole lot more serious than the marijuana game. Mm-hmm. It's a lot more deadly, a lot more violent. There's a lot more ripoffs. Right. Uh, you know, I dabbled in that game in my early 20s and I got right the fuck out of it. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I, I quickly learned it was not for me. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was not for me. So you started actually, you know, selling Coke. And I mean, at the height, were you moving kilos? Not from the start. Not from the start. From the start, I started off small and then got into the bigger packages later on. Okay. Did you think at that point, oh, okay, I, I might get caught. Let me let me stop. Or did you think like I'm just gonna stay under the radar and keep doing this forever? Well, at that point in time, believe it or not, I was I was thinking about stopping because I had made some money and I had a little money put away, just you know, for me to think about what I want to do, open a business, or do I want to try to find a job, something to lay back on, you know, because I had been selling drugs for so long. It was like I couldn't go fill out an application and tell them what my last job was, you know, so uh, that's just the route I took. Well, in 2001, you and uh, another guy in the car got pulled over uh, in Michigan Mm -hmm. and they found 25 pounds of marijuana in your car. Mm -hmm. By that point, how long had you, had you been selling drugs? Maybe two years. Okay. That was just, uh, that was just a, 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 a fluke trip that I should have never, ever tried to take. I should have never even thought about it. And somebody just telling me about getting some weed and they can... The money was so great. And by then, you know, I'm like, I'm at the point where I need money because I want to live a certain way and end up going up there not knowing that this person is probably the one that told on us. Hmm. Okay. And leading up to this, had you ever been pulled over, arrested? Did you ever come close to getting busted? For what, drugs back then? Other than yeah. those possession cases? No. No. Okay. And like I had mentioned with the cocaine game being what it is, was there ripoffs, guns pulled out, violence, nothing? You know, I wouldn't call it a blessing, but um, I was grateful enough that I did business with people that wanted their money. They just want money and products. All that other BS, we don't have to go through that, man. That's 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 beneath us. You know, you want to come over, we can eat with my family, you can come eat with your family, and we just, we do business that way. They don't do business with the violence. And if you need violence with your business, then there's no sense in you being in it. Right, you got lucky. I got very lucky. You got lucky, because usually there's violence that goes with that business. Right. You know, nine times out of ten. Yep. Okay, 
So then you get pulled over, like I said, in 2001. When that happens, were you like, oh my God, like, not only am I getting pulled over with drugs, but I'm also William Bedford, the NBA player. This is about to make like front page news. I didn't think about that. I know, when I got pulled over, the only thing I thought about was everybody finding out that I'm, I got caught coming across state line with marijuana. That's, that's the only thing I was, I was worried about. I did not know it was going to be nationally televised all over everywhere. I had no idea because when I, when I got out of jail, I got a bus ticket and took the bus back to Houston. And when I got back to Houston, you know, nobody knew that I got busted up there. Nobody knew anything. So I'm going around with my everyday activities and going out to eat. And I end up going to Joe's Crab Shack. And we sit in there eating. And one of the people at the table said, look at the TVs. And when I looked up, every TV in the place had my face on it. Wow. And then people turned around looking and seeing there was me there. I had to get up and leave right away. The manager told me I didn't even have to, we didn't even have to pay for the food. We could just leave when we wanted to. <laughs> I mean, every TV in the place told wow. him I was being indicted. It was on CNN. It was on everything. And uh, when they arrested me, they told all they told us. They say you'll be hearing from us when they let us out. They didn't even find, they didn't take no bond or nothing. They let us out and told them you'll be hearing from us. And then next thing I know, I'm on TV being indicted. There was no mail, none of that in front of coming before that to warn me. Yeah, yeah, that's how the feds do it. Yeah. They do 97% of their homework. Well, I guess after that arrest, um, you got arrested two more times for marijuana? Yeah, two more times after that. Okay. How are you getting arrested? That was Smoking in public? or the, No, well, see, one time I happened to be in the parking lot of a club, and I had been tipping this valet guy for the whole buku's time I've been down there. I've been giving him $10 every time. And this one night, he wants $25. And I end up going off on him, talk, calling him for words, but it was an officer close by. And he heard the commotion and he came over there and he went out telling me to leave. So I get in the car and he wants to pull me out the car before I get out the parking lot and get to talking to me. Then that's when some other cars come up and they get up looking in my car, finding the marijuana in my car. Yeah. So those two times you got arrested, that was just for you. Just fluke. That was just okay. marijuana I had in the car. Well, for two years, you had this case uh, hanging over your head. And then, I guess by 2003, you ended up pleading guilty to possession of cocaine with intent to distribute. Right. Okay, but this was cocaine, but you got busted with marijuana. Well, see, I got busted for marijuana. That, that... That ran with uh, some more guys I had got involved with from Memphis, and uh, they were being watched by the feds, and they got indicted, and I was number 11 on the indictment because I knew the guys. They were from my hometown. They came down there. I had dealt with them a couple of times, but, uh, you know, nothing that, that, that would cause a big stink about stuff, so... Uh, I didn't even think, I didn't even think highly of it. Right. But ultimately, you had to plead guilty. And when it came down to the judge, he gave you a 10-year prison sentence. Yes. Leading up to this, when you pled guilty, did you think it was going to be that many years? Well... You know me being dumbfounded about going to court on drugs. You know, you 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 for the possession cases. You know, you just fight, play fine and court causes, or you spend two three days in jail and you back out on the street. But this one, the judge told me 121 months. Me not calculating it, not thinking about it. I'm thinking, oh, I'm finna go with a jail for a few months and I'll be back out. And I end up getting back to the cell, talking to an older guy. He was like 60 some years old. And uh, he was telling me, he asked me, he said, well, how much time did you get? I told him, oh, man, I didn't get nothing but 121 months. And he was looking at me like, oh, you happy about that? I'm like, well, it's just 121. He said, man, do the math. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, 121 months, do the math. And I'm sitting up there thinking, I'm like, wait a minute. It's 30 days and I'm, what? He said, yeah, that's 10 years in one month. I lost it, yeah. I lost it. I'm like, what did I do to get 10 years in prison? 
to be going from playing basketball to be in prison. And, and shh, that was probably about the toughest thing in my life I ever had to face was actually being in the county jail, knowing you finna look at these bars for the next 10 years. Yeah, because you're 40 years old at the time. Yes. And it's a Fed case, which means 85%. 85%. Right. In the best case. But that's, you know the, I mean? that's top notch. 85%. <laughs> 85 is as good as it gets. Now, if you go and get into more trouble, and then that could turn into it could turn life. In. No, it definitely. I mean, I had a lot of friends. Well, not friends, but I made friends with some guys that was in the medium that were actually from Memphis and that followed me and played basketball in the whole nine yards through Memphis, but they just never made it to college and stuff. Their, their paperwork says deceased. And I'm looking at these guys, they're in their 40s and some of them 30-something, and I'm saying, man, you ain't never going home? They're like, no. They're going to forever be in prison until they die. And I ran across quite a few being in the federal prison system. I ran across quite a few people that was not going home. I mean, when you get transferred to the federal uh, prison facility, you know, you get checked in, your first night there, they close that door. How did that first night feel? I, I, well, I don't know because that first night happened when I got that 121 months and had to go sit back in the cell and think about, you got to go to another prison for 10 years. The, that feeling was the feeling of just giving up. Like, this is the end. This is it. There, there's, no, there's no more bottom but this. I mean, where else can you go? All I'm looking at is concrete and men. And I got to do this for 10 years? Yeah, I mean, from winning an NBA championship to being at the height of in the parades, society. In the parades, looking at the confetti, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Everybody. And can't hardly get through crowds and everything to the point to where you don't even want to go in that crowd. <laughs> right. You know, I, I remember I interviewed this rapper named Papoose, and he said when he got locked up in Rikers, that's when he really had his epiphany that he said, the only thing lower than being in prison is death. That's it. <laughs> it doesn't, you know what I mean? Like, and that's when he realized, like, okay, I got to change my life around. Because Absolutely. if I keep going back to prison, it's like I'm dying every time. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've watched guys go in and come back before I could even get out. And I'm like wondering why. This is, this is, I wouldn't even want to put my dog in this place. You know, you, you said in an interview, you said when you go to prison, you actually leave the age out on the street. You become a whole other person in prison. Their mindset while they're in prison has to be there because your survival. You've got to survive in prison and getting out, your mind is still there. You, you're gone for so long, that's all you know. So essentially time stops the moment you walk in, you know, well, into see, that cell. That depends. You can, you can change that yourself. Like you going in prison, I know for a fact federal prison has all the resources from HVAC to masonry to welding. They got all the school. They got everything, even windmill training where you can go up in those big windmills and learn how to fix. They got every training that you need. And it's up to you to do it. It's up to you to get out there. You can lay up in your cell all day. You can go gambling all day. You can go to the rec yard and play sports all day. You know, you can sit around and watch TV all day. But what are you what, what, what are you reflecting on? Why are you there? You know, that's when you get into other trouble. That's when you start getting into other problems around prison. But they got enough programs and, and a lot of things you can educate yourself at. Well, I mean, you had three years of college under your belt. Did you try to graduate from college while in prison? No, no, I didn't take any criminal. I, my major was criminal justice, and I didn't. I didn't want to uh, do that anymore. That was okay. That was not on my mind anymore for that. I did want to go back to school to try to do psychology because we took a, a, a drug program, which was a 500 hours, nine month program. And um, I got to talking to some of the counselors in there and, and, and as those nine months was going by, I ended up being a counselor talking to some other guys. I ended up leading some groups and being able to help other people that had that went through the similar things I went through. So then I got interested and wanted to be a counselor, but I never, I never um, followed up on it after I got out. 
What do you think was the most violent thing that you either experienced or saw while in prison? Because there's always violence. Hmm. Which one? I went to six different prisons. Just pick oh. pick the ones that stand, stand out the most. Beaumont, Texas. The nickname Bloody Beaumont. They made CNN. Had a body a week. They went through a riot there. Went through a riot in Big Spring. So it's it's prison. It's a whole nother world. Whole nother world. Right. I mean, you being a seven footer, I mean, obviously you stand out. People know you're from the NBA and so forth, but sometimes people get stripes for that type of thing. Did anyone ever try to test you, fight you, stab you? Uh, a couple of times, a few times it might have happened, but it didn't. It, 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 you don't. You try to diffuse most things that go on because one fight can start a whole compound to fighting. It can start other prisons to fighting, and nobody know why. Um, a few incidents I've got into were pretty much uh, staged to the point to where it was just an understanding that two people tried to get this off their chest, and that's it. I mean, it's still a horrible way to live. Yeah, but it, it, yeah. it's a horrible way to live. But if you're told to do one thing and you got to do that because you don't want 400 people on your back. Hmm. Well, then 2011 in November, you end up getting released. Mm -hmm. At that point, how much time did you spend behind bars? I spent um, nine years. I did nine years because the, the RDAP program put us out a year and a half off your time, guaranteeing uh, six months halfway house. Right. So you end up getting put in a halfway house. Mm -hmm. What was that first day walking out of that out of that cell like? Uh, I mean, it, it, it was it was okay for me because my last. Three years, I think my last three years, I had got a gate pass from the warden and uh, I could leave prison every day and go work at the warehouse and come back at uh, six in the evening. So I had got to the point to where I was working out there eight months and I told her, I said, I don't want to go back out no more because I feel like I'm re-entering prison every time I go out there. And she said, well, the only thing can keep you from going out there is you get a write-up. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I done been through some of the most notorious prisons. Here I am on my last leg getting out and I got to get a write-up to get off of that? She was like, yeah. I said, I'm going to get a write-up. She said, well, I'm going to still leave you out there because your record already show you're not that kind of prisoner. <laughs> so she left me outside in the warehouse. I stared at to tap me to be released. And then after being released, it was just like going to work. It was like walking out, getting in the van, getting ready to go to work until the point the way it hit me, I wasn't going back. Right, because you you got put in a halfway house and then by 2012, you left the halfway house. Yes. Uh, you got three years probation. Mm -hmm. But here you are with a, a drug felony on your record, mm -hmm. uh, no college degree, uh, close to 50 years old, I guess 49 years old. Yeah, 49. And you got to figure out what to do with the rest of your life. And I guess uh, you were a car salesman at one point? Yes, yes. I got out my first job. I mean, it took me about, hmm. It took a long time in my own city to find a, a job. And uh, I happened to go into Mississippi and find uh, a job selling cars at this Ford dealership. And I ended up staying out there for about 18 months and I transferred back to the dealership here in Memphis. Okay. Is that still your job? No, no. I was working, uh, I did car sales for probably five years. I did, uh, you know, for AutoNation Ford. After that, I started to try to get into coaching. They got a, a new school here that a guy opened up his Memphis Day Academy. I tried uh, coaching. And that aspect, and I found out that coaching probably really isn't for me because the kids these days are not like the kids were when we back and we playing, you know. And um, I decided to, uh, no, I don't want to go into coaching, so I need to find something else to do. 
And then me and my wife got together and I started talking to her about food because I always liked to cook. I worked in the cafeteria. I worked in the child halls. I worked in the, in the, in the prisons where, you know, I had to feed 1,200 people. I'm in charge of that. So um, I told her I want to start, you know, let's get a food trailer. And ever since, you know, probably was last year, I got a food trailer and uh, I started running around town now. That's what I do now. I'm my own small business. I mean, how hard was it? You're coming out of prison. You know, you're not really used to really working a nine to five job. And now you're selling cars. Well, there's another thing. There's another thing. When you're in prison, you're going to get used to working a nine to five job. They wait. You got to get out of that bunk at 630 in the morning. And you got to get somewhere and you got to be somewhere until four o'clock main count. You can't be running around on the compound. So where you going to be? You got to have a job. And then those jobs, you're making 20 cents an hour. So in my mind, if I come out, I can get a job, anything making more than 20 cents an hour would be great. But then I got luck and jumped into car sales. Right. And I think in 2019, um, you started working with Manhood University. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, you know, it's designed to uh, reduce recidivism, you know, in terms of prisoners coming back to society. And um, you actually spoke about that. You said, why am I here? Mainly, I'm here to better myself. I went to the NBA. That's another part of my life. After the NBA, I made some wrong choices and got in trouble with some wrong people and had to do time. You really can't find a job that you can make a good living being my age and being my height. I went through a few programs that they had, but they didn't work. So, you know, you basically talked about how being a seven-footer in the NBA with a felony on your record, trying to find a regular job, you know, as you have a whole new direction in your life. I mean, it's, it definitely sounds tough. Yeah, it is. It really is. I mean, it's hard to pick up and start something new. That's why you got to. And then when you want to work for somebody, it's like, like at my age, it's like it's hard for me to go work for somebody, you know, and that's going to tell me what to do and what not to do. Because then I'm going to start reframing back to I went through prison with this. Telling me every waking moment what I got to do and how I got to do it. It just wasn't set right with me when I don't have a door closed behind me. You don't have no keys. I'm not under arrest. Now, that don't sit right with me. So I said, well, you better start doing something for yourself. You got to yeah. keep in your own business. Right. Ultimately, that's what you did. You have your food truck, mm -hmm. which is dope, which is great. Uh, so what's next for you? Well, I'm not really sure. You know, I really, I really want this food truck to bring me a building so I can have my own restaurant. That's one of my number one goals, to have my own restaurant and be able to walk out and see all these people and, you know, know that they're eating something I created. Uh, I recently, I got married and I celebrated my first year anniversary. And uh, that's another step. Uh, pretty much. It's just to work hard from here and making the marriage work and making the business work and doing a normal life. Uh, you have kids? Yes, I have kids. I have kids. Okay. And, uh, How old were your kids when you went in? Oh, my last, my kids, my last two kids were 18 months and eight months when I went in. Wow. Yeah. So they out. I, I, I got out and uh, when I got out, I got custody of them. And I raised them for the next five years. So now they just yeah. moved back to Houston. So, but, but that must have been tough to go in at 18 months and then to come out when they're 10 years old, essentially. And you missed yeah. all that. Yeah, I, I missed a lot. And uh, um, I'm grateful for the people that was at the CPS place or where they were. They kept them in touch, kept me in touch with them. Uh, had my counselor, you know, let me get on the phone with them sometime and talk to them up until they can understand who they was talking to. And then after I got out, I was allowed to go to visit and see them, you know, before I check into the halfway house. 24 hours before you get out of prison to the time you check in the halfway house, you got 24 hours. So within that 24 hours, I went to see them. And it, it, it shocked me because they actually knew who I was. And I didn't think, you know, eight months, no, 18 months, maybe. But they act like they knew who I was and it was on from there. So you never visited them or well, they never visited you while you were locked up? No, they, they didn't visit me when I was locked up. Mom, mom took them and ran off.
Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah. Well, William Bedford, um, quite a story. Uh, quite a story. And it, it seems like most kids who are growing up, their dream is to make it to the NBA. You know, if they once they pick up a basketball, it's like they want to be the NBA, not realizing that that's only step one. Getting into the NBA, you know, is the first step. Staying in the NBA is the harder step as you're sitting there competing with the best players from all over the planet. I mean, these days, the NBA is international. They'll find a guy in Beirut. They'll find a guy in Zimbabwe. You know what I mean? They'll find any seven-footers on the planet, train them up and put them in there, and, and they're all just as hungry as you are. And it just kind of shows that not all that you know glitters is gold because you know there are you know the NBA success stories and so forth, but I think the majority are people like yourself that get in the NBA, play a few years, make some money, and then have to figure out what they have to do with the rest of their life because they're still young men when the league is over. Yeah, you know, you know they have a, a lot of years left to live, and they have a family, and they're used to a certain type of lifestyle. And I think that the story of what you went through of like, oh, let me try to do something illegal to try to maintain this money, is a very common story. You know, it's not always illegal, but you see people that that try to flip their money, do scams, you know, they gamble, and a lot of them end up in the same place that you did. Right. So I think this is a, kind of just a very important story that people have to learn that it, it's, the NBA will not call, you know, will not cure all your life's problems. No. It's just a part of your life. No, it's just a part, you know, just like holding a job. Once you finish that job, it's over with. Yeah. 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 And so you're not involved in the NBA at all anymore? You're not, you don't no, go to events no, or no, anything I'm, else like I'm, that? I'm, I'm not involved in the NBA uh, at all because, you know, it's taking up all my time with this food trailer. But um, if an opportunity came up for me to get back there, acclimated with the NBA, doing something, yeah, yeah, I would jump back into it both feet. But at this point, nothing has come up like that. Well, I talked to John Sally, who's a regular on my show and also a good friend of mine. And... You know, I asked him, hey, you know, I'm about to interview uh, William Bedford. Uh, and I don't know if you actually heard, but your name came up in one of our interviews before. Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen yeah, it. John Sally mentioned it. Yeah, I've seen it. And uh, I, I asked him, you know, what should I ask him you know, during our interview? And he said, I quote, tell him I love him. And I'm sorry if I hurt his feelings mentioning his name, but he was a major influence in my moves with people. He's one of my favorite teammates. Real talk. No, he didn't hurt my feelings. I know John. I know how John talk. I know <laughs> I know Sal, put it that way. There's two people. You got John and you got Sal. So Right. Yeah. That's what it is, man. William Bedford, I appreciate the time, man. Wish you all the best for your family and your business. I hope that food truck takes off the way you're planning it. You know what I mean? Hope to you get that big popping restaurant. You know, that blows up and has multiple locations and you could live off your retirement in style. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate being on. Absolutely. Until next time. All right. Peace. Thank you.